Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get started. We're still missing some people, but uh, I I want to make some comments to follow up on Ron Flick's presentation last week on sea level rise, and then I will introduce our guest speaker. So, first of all, some of the takeaways I think from Ron Flick's talk was inundation is a permanent situation. It's caused by sea level rise. Flooding is a temporary situation. It happens frequently when we have storms and so on, and it typically lasts from a few hours to a few days and occasionally a week or so. Inundation, the permanent submergence of our coastline, won't be a major issue for several decades, but long term, it's going to be a real problem. And the potential for serious flooding is always a threat. As sea level continues to rise, and it will for decades and perhaps longer, even if we eliminated all further emissions of greenhouse gases, the potential for damage by storms and increases because you're putting storms on top of a higher stand of sea level so they will have greater destructive power. This shows what happened with sea level starting here in the present back 542 million years. You can see it's been a very noisy signal. And uh, the last million years or so, we have been in what's called the Pleistocene. It's a period of alter alternating periods of glacial epochs and interglacials. The glacials typically have lasted the order of 100,000 years, and the warm interglacials have lasted 15 to 20,000 years. And if you look back through the geologic record, during the warm interglacials, sea level has been anywhere from two meters, so six feet, to 20 meters, 60, 65 feet higher than today. So we live in interesting times. If all of the ice were to melt, this is where the coastline would be. You can see we would lose all of Florida, much of this part of Texas. Maybe that would be a good thing. No. <laughs> no. And, and, um, Louisiana. <laughs> yes, Louisiana. And remember this figure from Flick? And the, this was the end of the last glacial. Sea level rose rapidly up until about six, 7,000 years ago. And it was this period when sea level was really quite stable. That's when most civilization happened. That's when our great cities were built. And so it wasn't that people were dumb building so close to the ocean. It looked like the place to be. The weather climate was better than farther inland. You were close to good seafood. Um, sea level seemed to be stable. Why not build there? But more recently, We've seen a rise in sea level. The red at the end here is the time since we've been able to measure sea level even more accurately than with tide gauges by using satellites. And this is just, if this is global mean sea level, and if this is, these are the different scenarios looking out to the end of the century, depending upon how we do in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see there's a big range, all the way from two-tenths of a meter up to two meters. Um, and most of the people now believe it's more likely going to be in the higher part of the range than in the lower part of the range. So if you have a house really near the coast, if you've got a relative you don't particularly like, try to sell your house to them. And, <laughs> Um, all right, the two big uncertainties are Greenland and Antarctica. There's Antarctica, this wonderful continent covered with ice. And if all of the ice on Antarctica were to melt, how much would sea level rise? 200 feet. That's a lot of rise of sea level. Now, Antarctica is not all going to melt in the next few decades, or much longer than that probably, although we could lose some of it. Greenland is another one. If all that were to melt, how much would sea level rise? 
20 feet. So 20 versus 200, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, and we see that in Alaska, so if there are places. But these are global sea level rises that I'm talking about. But what you say is correct. As, sea, as ice has melted on Alaska, Alaska in some places has risen more rapidly than sea level rise. So if you're living on part of the course of Alaska, it would appear that sea level is actually falling. Like the suit won't down, down no, no, no. Remember, the ocean covers 71% of the Earth. And so these are global sea level rises. So if, when I read all the literature, I, I think it's probably uh, in the three to seven feet range. Um, some people put it at, uh, at 20 feet, Hansen et al. Hansen is one of the, the climate scientists who was so important in bringing this whole issue to the public. He believes it's going to ri rise by 10, 20 feet. There will be large regional differences, though. And it will be primarily because of the coastline, for example, in the Gulf is sinking. So therefore, it appears that sea level is rising more rapidly there than in other areas, as I mentioned, in Alaska. So there are large regional differences. For and the two sources of sea level rise are the addition of new meltwater and expansion. For every degree Fahrenheit sea level warms, it expands by the rises by a half a foot to a foot. And it, up until recently, the two, the expansion and addition of new water, were roughly equal. The addition of new water now is greater, and it will continue to be greater. And of all the mountain glaciers, now these, so the Greenland and Antarctica, those are not mountain glaciers. If all the mountain glaciers were to melt, it would only be a foot. But it would have many other more serious consequences in terms of the loss of fresh water for lots of people. And the most dramatic example of that would be the Tibetan Plateau. So here's a map of the world. We're going to take a tour. And in the sequence in which cities come up, these are the ones that are at the greatest risk of flooding. Miami, out of all the cities in the world. New York, New Orleans. Then way over there, what's going on here? Tokyo, Amsterdam, Rotterdam. I can't read from over there. OK, you're going. Virginia Beach, Tampa, St. Petersburg. It's interesting that if you look at all of those, those, how many, look how many of them are in the United States. Oops, let's go back to that a second. So you can see that the US has more than its fair share of cities that would be threatened by a rise of sea level of a meter or so by the end of the century. This is one of the, the most vulnerable places on the planet, and it's Bangladesh. Here we see this huge, huge delta in Bangladesh. Here's, it is from a satellite. It's a magnificent area. This is a closer up view of it. And a one meter rise of sea level would displace 13 million people, which is 11% of its population. And it would drown about 20% of its agricultural <coughs> land. Deltas around the world as a category are all very vulnerable to rises in sea level um, because they're so low, low lying. But here's the United States. We built too close to the ocean. This is in the Gulf, Gulf Coast. If you want waterfront property, 
That's the place to do it. These are some houses that used to be on land that in the Gulf now are out. Small Pacific islands are very vulnerable. There's no, not much place to move to, to go to higher ground in many of these. So some of these, the only choice they will have is to find other countries to move to. Not all countries are willing to take refugees, as we know. And it is going to be a continuing problem for many decades and probably much longer. Coral Island, well, in the past, the way they, they grew was, this is Darwin's theory, that they, as sea level rose, they grew up to keep pace with the rising sea. So, yes. But they'll be underwater. Really. They'll be underwater. And, and this was after Katrina. This was also after Katrina in New Orleans. Another one of Katrina. And remember now, this was flooding, not inundation. This was temporary, but it caused huge amounts of damage. And you can see that arrow there is the same as that arrow there. And this was separated by five days in September. And this is another one by six days. That arrow is there. That house, that arrow is there. So you can see flooding can cause a great deal of damage in a short period of time. California Coastal Commission provides guidance. And it's for the, these three different time periods. And this is for south of Cape Mendocino. North of Cape Mendocino, sea level is rising more slowly because the northern part of the California coast is being uplifted. And so the, the, percentage, the increases there would be less. And the range they give depends upon how expensive the structure is and what you expect its lifetime to be. So if you're building a small house, you probably can get away with five inches. But if you're, if you're building a larger structure that has a longer lifespan, they want you to plan on two feet and, and so on with these. The real issue now and in the future will be what gets superimposed on these rises of sea level. King tides, El Ninos, and coastal storms, and they can amount to several feet any time now. So global warming is a hoax. There's Rush Limbaugh. Um, sea level is up to his chest, but it's still a hoax. And don't worry, Mildred, our federal flood insurance will cover it as long as we rebuild right here. One of the problems that we have is we encourage people to build too close to the shoreline, too close to rivers, too close to fire zones, too close to mud slumping areas because we provide insurance. That should change. And then one fish saying to the other, someday, lad, <laughs> This will all be yours. So now with that, I want to introduce our speaker, Peter Kariva. Peter, is, but don't give him a, you don't give him a hand yet. He has to get, <laughs> let, let, oh, is that for me? <laughs> now that I can understand. All right, Peter Kariva. He's the director of the Institute for the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA. So if anybody ought to know something about sustainability, it should be Dr. Kariva. He's been there for two years. Before that, he was the chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy for a decade. Before that, he was uh, with NOAA in the head of the conservation program in the Northwest uh, office. He has had a number of academic appointments. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences. I think if one were going to make a list of the top ecologists, Peter would be on mine, and he would be near the top, not just now, but 
for all time. He has put humans back into the equation. He has a very realistic approach to conservation that we humans are a product of nature, we're part of nature, and now we're responsible for taking care, better care of, of nature. And it's a real pleasure to invite Peter Kariva to the aquarium. <laughs> Well, um, I turn my thing on. No, 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 not at all. So thanks for all those compliments. I hope somebody here is tweeting them because if you tweet them, then we know they're facts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I want to start a little bit, uh, you know, asking about how cities before we turn to the environmental and ecological issues with cities. Uh, it's useful to think about their history. I mean, why we have cities? Why do we have cities? What did they start with? So the, the, the first towns like, were pretty small. About 8,000 years ago, we started noticing towns. Uh, they'd be 500 to 1,000 dwellings. We wouldn't call them cities. They were primarily for defense. And the reason we know they were primarily for defense is that not only were they walled, but they, you know, in, the, in the actual houses, the doors into them were not like we have doors there, they were in the roof. So it was very hard to get in and out of them. It was all for protection. So early on, they were basically forts, protection for, fall, so for small communities. Um, Go forward in time to maybe 3000 BC, and then we start to see real cities. So, Uruk in Mesopotamia, so Iraq, uh, 50 to 80,000. You would recognize that as a city. And it's kind of interesting. Back then, we estimate that 90% of Mesopotamia was urban. It's not that high now. Not that high now in terms of percent urban. And uh, this is sort of an artist's rendition, awful lot of digging, a lot of archaeological work done uh, here. And uh, there's a number of kind of interesting things about these early cities. Uh, typically, a temple in the center. Religion was part of it. Um, they, they're always in places, if you, if you go to other uh, places in the world where they started to have cities, they're always in places where there were a lot of calories. By that I mean you could get a lot of food and acquire resources. There are a lot of calories to be had. Still were walled, uh, but they were the first place, Europe was the first place that there was mass production. They actually had these forged clay pots. You know, they were, that they were in molds, and they found over 100,000 of exactly the same pot all over Mesopotamia. So the very beginning of mass production back then. And you could tell when you do the digs there that there's sort of, there are neighborhoods, and there were, there, there were specialties. So the, the population was broken up, but especially, so you would have uh, people in trade, the clay pots, butchers, and so forth in different parts of the neighborhood. The city certainly accumulated wealth, but the other interesting sort of thing is, is just deducing by the size of the houses. So if you figure that, that you know, the size of a house is some indication of wealth, and you can look at the distribution of the size of houses in a big city like this, uh, there, wasn't any, there, there weren't any really, really rich people or really, really poor. I mean, it was all a pretty equitable city. The power is probably uh, in, in, the, in sort of the, the, the temple and the religion. So, uh, and then, you know, so the, the, around the world, Nile Valley, Indus Valley, Yellow River, uh, the initial big cities were always in very fertile agricultural areas, often on rivers, very fertile areas, 
and they would accumulate the resources from the big area. And when some of those cities perished, it was because there were droughts or the, the agricultural productivity declines. So a, a city might perish because it wasn't garnering all the resources for that area. Uh, then you have a sort of a burst, and I'm not going to go through the European cities because I think you have enough of a sense of history of Europe. Although to recognize, even in Europe, there was still a lingering sense of which cities were walled. Uh, so it was a big deal in, in Vienna in 1857 when they tore down their walls. There was a transition in, in Europe where this, the main point of the cities really became commerce, an exchange of cultures, cultures and exchange of ideas. So prior to this transition, yes, yeah, cities gathered resources. There's a lot going on in them, but they, 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 they what, what made them successful was sort of the city unto itself. In this transition period, what made the cities vibrant, the successful, the, the cities that everybody thought of as the great cities, was their commerce and their exchange of cultures, the people moving between them. And it was, you know, roughly during the time period of our Civil War that this transition was going on. And so I, I, I know you've seen this figure before. Uh, you know, we recently, uh, about a decade ago, made a switch where for the first time in history, most of the human population lives in cities, sort of the modern cities. And uh, it's anticipated by 2050, it'll be 70%. So we are truly an urban world now. I mean, that we are an urban species. I mean, the cities are, cities are our habitat. And if you were, you know, like any species, when you're an ecologist, you say, what's the habitat of the species? Our habitat is the city. And increasingly so. Mm -hmm. I went to a case by China where the population was moving from an agricultural to an industrial society versus the United States, where we're probably just expanding the city out into the suburbs and making the city bigger. So that's it. You know, the, the whole issue of, of urbanization is an interesting thing. It, you are exactly right in China. Uh, I have a Chinese, visiting Chinese professor in my lab now, so we talk about this. China has m amazing data on cities. They have amazing environment, they have better data than we do on just about everything. So we've been taught, in China, it was a national policy that the way you get economic growth is move people to the cities. I mean, that was their model for economic growth. Build cities, move people to cities. And it was very deliberate. Uh, other countries have had that idea, India, is still one of the countries that is, that is um, um, not as urbanized. I think it's maybe about 45%, but it hasn't passed even the 50%. 50% might even be as low as 38%. India, seeing what happened in China, they wanted the same model of the urbanizing. It hasn't worked. Culturally, they, they haven't been able to get the people to move to cities so much. Um, Latin America is totally urbanized. So, so it, in, in some areas, it happens naturally because people move there for job opportunities and for intellectual reasons. In China, it was a policy. It was a federal policy. Latin America, it happened sort of naturally. In Africa, it's kind of a mixed bag. In, um, and as I said, in India, they wanted it to be a national policy. It just hasn't worked. So it, it, it varies. But even in the US, um, if you look at the emptying out of our rural landscape and our farm towns, it's because the younger generation doesn't want to live, they don't see the economic opportunity. They move to cities for economic opportunity. And I've done a fair bit of field work in Mongolia. Mongolia's got two million people. It's, you know, it's got one city, really, Ulaanbaatar. And you go out uh, into the girls and work with the, and talk to the herders, and what do the kids want to do? They all want to move to Ulaanbaatar. So. So this is where we live in the US. Uh, pretty interesting. So 80% of the US lives in cities, 80%. And it's, you know, it's interesting, pause and think about that. 
you know, if you were to think about, um, you know, the television shows you grew up with, right? The television shows you, you grew up with. What were they about? They weren't about living in cities, all of them. The, the sort of mi the myths, the, the just sort of the American story is not anywhere near as urban as we are. The sort of, it's, it's like our, our folk um, stories. Our common culture is, has, has not quite caught up to exactly how urban we are. Increasingly so, but not that much. I love this map. See these red, these red counties? That's half of the US. Half of the US. Isn't that crazy? So that's where, I mean, this is about sustainability, but this is a wonderful map to think about when you think about politics, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and things. Yeah, this is done by county, so they might be in big counties, and, and it doesn't work. So this is, this is, this is a, not a city, this is a county. So you just, you, all that they did is they rank ordered the counties, the top counties, rank ordered in terms of the population. At the point it became 50%, they stopped making a map. You see how you did that. Doesn't mean that those don't have a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. What's the first of this map? Uh, I can get that, for, this is, um, uh, it's a really good website of, of urban data. All, the, the other map was too. Uh, I, it might have been the New York Times did a series on them, if I'm thinking right, but it's, I, can, I can get it for you. That map might be driving me to the electoral college. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on where you live, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jerry and I were talking about this earlier. There's another feature of cities, and that's the density in cities. So this is the uh, uh, you know, population per unit area, population density, people per hectare. And I'm sorry, it's, uh, this is the best copy I could get, but you could, the colors are what matter. The reds are US. So we have low density cities. This is New York right there. This is LA. We're far below New York, but we're uh, a lot better than, well, a little bit better than Washington, better than San Francisco. Even San Francisco Bay Area, a lot better than Chicago, Portland, Houston, Atlanta. So the red is the U.S. in population density, right? Blue is Asia. Pink is Africa. Look at how that split. I mean, Africa is all over the place, right? Because African cities are, 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 are so diverse in their sprawling growth. But you really, you know, you base, I mean, you, in a sense, it's a simplification, but if you, you could sort of say, here's the Asian cities, really dense, European, yellow, in between, and low, low density cities, the US. Right? It's surprising it sorts out that, you know, it's a reflection of culture, culture and history. Not physical constraints, it's culture and history. So why do we live in cities? Um, you know, I've, I've hinted at it a little bit, but I just read a recent book, so I had to throw this in there because it really changed my effect. I, my, I just recommended it to Jerry, The Knowledge Illusion. And um, it makes the point, it, it's really talking about the evolution of the human um, it's, by cognitive, it's a, a pair of cognitive psychologists, uh, really good researchers. So these are not journalists. These are researchers writing in a popular text about their research, but they give you links to all the research papers. So, um, it's Stephen Sloman and Philip Fernback. But if you look up the knowledge illusion, you'll find it very easily. And so the, you know, here's, here's how they think, and, and, and this, will be, this will become obvious in a few seconds why I'm talking about this in a talk about cities. Um, they emphasize that uh, you know, our intelligence, our brain evolved uh, 
and not to sit like you guys are in a lecture room. Our brain evolved to be active, to take action. Our brain evolved organized hunting. Um, think sort of you, the, this picture is like uh, you know Native Americans driving buffalo off a cliff. If you read the accounts of what that was required, that was really, that required so much organization, strategy, and planning for the whole process. You had somebody sort of dressed in a buffalo skin, leading them forward. You had uh, people on the side hurting them. You had people at the bottom of the cliff. You know, it's not easy to, to uh, butcher a buffalo. I mean, it all organized, planned activity. So uh, we don't actually have in our, we don't have the ability to recall that much information in our brains. There's really, really cool experiments that, that, that um, uh, these guys have done. And, they, and uh, it's, it's so simple. What they do is they show, you, they show you pictures, or they play music, or they read you passages, or you read a passage. And then they come back sometime later and say, they don't ask you to remember it. They just say, have you seen it before? Have you heard it before? Have you read these words before? See, see what they're doing? They're not asking you to memorize things. They're saying, have you seen it, heard it? Turns out that we learn and forget all three of those things at the same rates, which I, is, to me, not obvious that, that that is the case, but all three of them at the same rates. But if by doing that, they can see the rate at which you can learn, and then they can also see the rate at which you lose information, and see how long you live, and so they've come up with an estimate. Maybe they're off by a little bit. But by a wide variety of methods, they come up with an estimate that say um, that we basically can recall I had our, you know, a gigabyte of information, a gigabyte. I like the point that they make is you, know, you always hear about the humans being called a, like our brain is a computer. And they point out if our brain's a computer, it's a really lousy computer. <laughs> uh, because you know, your smartphone right there has got 32 gigabytes. Right? But what happens? I mean, how are we so smart? Well, it's our culture and our social connection. We may not be able to recall, but somebody else who has a different experience or a different specialty can recall. And it's the, it's the combination. I mean, obviously, our brains are problem solving and, and give us some special gifts. But it's very much a social enterprise. And you even look at science. And you know, there's a myth in science that you have this lone ranger genius, like Jerry, right? That's a myth. <laughs> but, but, but most of us who practice science, sometimes you don't even know what your own idea, who, who came up with the idea. You actually don't know who came up with the idea. It's very, you know, the, the folks that won the, the Nobel Prize for the Higgs boson thing, there are like 3,000 authors involved in the key papers leading up to that. So, so our innovation, our discovery, our, our problem solving, um, in spite of all the myth of this sort of genius, isolated person, is very, very social. And, and I, in any enterprise, whether you're in business or law or something, I bet you many of you have experienced the most exciting times is a conversation with three or four colleagues, you're bouncing ideas off, things happen. Okay? So. What's it said to do with cities? Ah, so there's been a whole series of studies done where you look at the size of cities. These are big databases, two, three hundred, four hundred cities. And so uh, along the horizontal axis and all these things is um, the size of the city, bigger to the right. And on a vertical axis it diff is different things that go up. And you know, you, cities are more fast-paced. Guess what? You, if you go to a city, uh, people walk faster the bigger the city is. Pretty predictably. The first paper in this, I remember I read it as a graduate student. Somebody actually got a paper in a very prestigious journal and very famous for going to cafes in Europe, sitting in a cafes and timing the rate at which people walk by. <laughs> so, but they've done it more seriously than that. Bigger than population. Bigger population, um, wages, total wages, so wealth. Wealth goes up. Uh, super creatives, this is some data, that, this actually is a, st a, a categorization used in labor statistics. Super creatives are um, 
they're educators, they're artists, they're computer programmers, they're designers. Uh, there's a whole, there's actually an official list of professions that are called super creatives. Goes up with cities. And in fact, with the database, the other thing that happens, it's not so interesting that they go up with cities, but they go up exponentially. What do I mean by that? So if you double a city size, do you get twice as many patents or more than twice as many patents? Right, more than twice as many. And so these are some of the things that are go faster than linear with an increased population. New patents. The number of inventors, the total wages. GDP, there's some things that go faster than linear that may not be desirable, serious crimes. So these go, you know, more than, it's this exponential thing going on. These are basically linear. If you double the city size, if you, you get twice as many houses. If you double the city size, you get twice as many jobs. If you double the city size, you get twice as much electricity consumption. Actually, actually that's a little bit, there's no advantage of scale there in savings. Uh, if you double the city size, you get twice as much um, water consumption. These are leveling off. That means if you doubled it, you less than double gasoline stations. That's a good thing, right? There's fewer gasoline stations. Uh, actually, road surface. The, 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 you, there's fewer roads you know, per, per unit population. The list is much longer than, you know, they, they, they look at a lot of things I've just assembled, just a few that I think are interesting to talk about, think about. So, so, so we, we obviously, we, we, are, we go to cities, uh, it's where the action is. Uh, it's, it's peaceful, it's wonderful. You know, I'm an ecologist, I love to hike. I got into ecology because I want to be outdoors. Um, but uh, if I want to be stimulated, I go to a city. And it, it really is where the intellectual innovation happens. So in spite of that, uh, we also know all the sort of dystopian stories about what could go wrong with cities. So I will, uh, I will just remind you of some of them, that the great smog in London last for five days, 4,000 extra people died. Yeah, I mean, it was so, they, they couldn't play soccer games in, in theaters. You go to London to go to a play. It was so thick inside some theaters that they couldn't have plays. It, the sidewalk was greasy with black stuff. You'd walk, just walking outside in this, your face would be, um, um, you know, you'd get, gr you'd get grimy face. It was during a particularly cold spear. I mean, this is associated with a cold spell. At that time, it was all coal heating. And because it was an unusually cold, and there was an inversion, a combination of the cold, all the coal heating, and the inversion, and you got this. Sh shortly after that, uh, UK, England sort of passed air quality laws and started tackling it. But, you know, this was, LA at its worst would have seemed like clean air compared to this. And uh, so, not such a great thing about a city. Right, so one of the interesting... Right, one of the interesting things, and it's such a big area of research at UCLA, but what you, what you mentioned, we just call smog, but there's actually chemical reactions going on. And the nature of those chemical reactions are not, the, it's, it's a pretty active area of research, particularly matters, and, 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 and those chemical reactions can either mitigate the health effects or exacerbate them. This is the traffic jam. And all traffic jams, right? Um, this is because they, they <laughs> Beijing traffic jam. Um, you see the people there? Uh, too bad they didn't have tents and sleeping bags or something. But um, some cars stuck in it for five days, 100 kilometers long. The rate at which it moved was less than a mile a day. 
It all happened. I, I can't remember whether they closed one or two lanes. They were doing rope repairs. They, 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 we've all experienced this particular phenomena. It's like, why are they repairing the road when everybody's trying to get out of the city on Fourth of July weekend? Well, it was a holiday weekend. Everybody's trying to get out or get back in. And then they had shut down some lanes for some road repairs, and it blew up into this. It wasn't an accident. It was not an accident. And sewage. So I would look at that. Air pollution, traffic jams, and sewage, the beauty of cities, right? <laughs> um, you know, still in New York, there's a lot of raw sewage dumped into the Hudson River. This is an advisor here. Due to a recent wastewater discharge in Austin, in the Hudson River, Department of Health has advised against swimming, windsurfing, kayaking, or canoeing in the Hudson River till further notice. Uh, so this happens not because we, we have sewage treatment plants, but it happens because when you have heavy rain um, uh, and the sewage system and the stormwater system are combined, it overtaxes them and you just dump raw sewage. It's pretty bad what happens. It's pretty bad. And so this is still happening every year in, in New York, in New York City. Does not. Um, so there's 722 cities in the U.S. that have combined stormwater and sewage. So this, it, it, this is a cartoon of the point, but that sort of is a character of it. But basically, heavy rain, uh, the run, it goes to the storm drains, but this, there's so much rain it overtaxes the treatment plant. The treatment plant can't handle it, and its raw sewage is dumped. 700 over 700 cities in the U.S. L.A. is not one of them. So be grateful. <laughs> LA is not one of them. San Francisco is. So, in the LA San Francisco culture wars, you should bring that up more often. <laughs> right, right. I think I'll take a break after. Uh, so, um, what I'm going to, for the second half of this, what I'm going to uh, transition to is this notion that these cities have wonderful benefits. There's, there's, there, you know, there's social, there's sources of innovation, art, creativity, but boy, they can really screw up, can't they? When you have the sewage, the air pollution, the traffic jams. Actually, cities are great for, um, for, for conservation. Uh, and, they're, and they're great for conservation because they mean people are out, out on the landscape. So in Africa, in Africa, as they're urbanizing and people are moving off the landscape, then there's, there's, less great, there's less sort of abuse of the land. Same thing has happened in Latin America and a number of places. Even in the U.S., abandonment of some agricultural land, it returns to forest and wildland as people move to cities. So the movement to cities, the density uh, in cities can all be a positive thing for conservation of the environment. But you know, it doesn't always turn out that way either. This is my you know, Blade Runner. It's either Blade Runner or Ecotopia. That's our choice. Blade Runner or Ecotopia. And um, why don't we take a break now and we'll come back. That what we're going to do for the second half is, is talk about that choice from sustainability science point of view. And, and what we've learned in the last decade about how to make a, a, a city sustainable. But the thing to recognize, that I, I really want to drive home, it's, we make that choice. We, we as a, you know, LA is making that choice. Different cities are making that choice right now. And there's pathways for cities that are really positive pathways, and there's pathways that are not. So. Okay, I'll, I'll tell Jerry's story now because I might forget about it otherwise. <laughs> um, there actually is this, there, there, um, there's a lot of narratives around the environment. And I actually, I'm going to add one more to it. So, to, to, self-reliant is the Thoreau story. 
Um, so, and I know everybody worships Thoreau, and I got in trouble because I made fun of Thoreau because I pointed out that it's, you know, it's pretty easy to live in a cabin if your mom comes and does your laundry. <laughs> okay, I'm not. <laughs> yes, you're there in nature, and that's great, but you are being supported. Um, so, it, but there is, you know, sort of the, the if, if in my old business, in the conservation business, all my graduate students, all of my graduate students wanted to live in cabins. But some of them built cabins in Alaska. You know, that, that was their dream, to, to live in a cabin by themselves. They're all male. So uh, the women in my lab were, more, were smarter. Um, and, and then there's the sustainability thing, which is, you know, really, it's, that, it's even kind of selfish to want to live in a cabin, because we couldn't all live in a cabin, right? If, if, if even one thousandth of us made that decision, there'd be no wildlands. There wouldn't be any place for grizzlies. You know, there wouldn't be. Even one thousandth, probably, I could, do the, I could sit down and do the math. But if a tiny fraction of the population actually decided to live in a cabin, it'd be the worst thing in the world that could happen for nature. You know, all these cabins dotted all over the place. And, and so it feels good. Look at me. I'm, you know. I make no footprint, I do this, I, you know, make my own clothes and whatever. Um, but it's a choice, it's a, and if you look at those people, they, you know, they're retired professors or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is also, you know, I, what I lecture about, so the sustainability is thinking about it more as a public good and a social good, not as an individual. It's what is a public good and a social good. What behavior, what mode of living is a public good and a social good? That's what sustainability is. You know, there's so many formal definitions, but it's basically leave the planet, uh, ideally, better for your kids than when you were born. But certainly not worse. So it's about leaving the planet in a condition. That's a social and public good. In the, in the uh, social sciences, there's actually a debate out there now that, people, that, that there's another word that people want to talk about, and that is resourcefulness. And they talk about resourcefulness not as self-reliance, but in society, we need to encourage, particularly for cities, the ability to be resourceful in the face of climate change and things like that. And I actually like that word, resourcefulness and institutions and education and, and regulations that, that really encourage resourcefulness, as well as one of our choices. So the social scientists write about this uh, all the time. They don't like just sustainability. They actually don't like They think we define things too much as an ecologist and not enough as uh, what do people do in response to things like Katrina or the New York floods. OK, so now you take a break. When you come back, we're going to be doing uh, sustainability science for cities. I, I, I'm going to switch the order of the slides a little bit because I think it, it, it tells a better story this way. And it's still a true story. But, um, uh, you know, I've been a conservation biologist for maybe 30 years, spotted owl trials, salmon, uh, worked for the Nature Conservancy, so forth. And if any of you pay attention to conservation, you may notice that the conservation groups, the traditional conservation groups that talk about wildlands, grizzly bears, wolves, biodiversity, and all that, have moved to the cities. They have. Uh, Nature Conservancy has a huge program. World Wildlife does. Audubon does. Conservation um, uh, International does. And Wildlife Conservation Society does. I know because I work with all of them still. And this is just a map of the cities where the Nature Conservancy does urban conservation, meaning they have a real, I mean, that means they have staff in those cities to do urban conservation with real conservation goals in many different ways. They create a network and they try to learn from each other. That's a huge switch. That, I hired the first urban conservationist at the Nature Conservancy. His name was Rob McDonald. He wrote a book about it. But um, you might so why'd they do this? Uh, there's a lot of reasons. I'll tell you the one reason that's not often told 
that really drove it home to me is a lot of my job used to be fundraising, and I was in out Los Angeles at a public event. I have no idea what I was talking about, but um, there is a strong Latino activist audience segment of the population. And some young woman raised her hand and said, why should we care about what you care about when you don't care about us here in LA in a public forum? And it, it, that had a resonance. I mean, you know, I, we, we, luckily I had an answer. I had an answer because uh, fortunately one of uh, 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 a sort of a, a young woman who made a difference uh, had found, had started a program where she took high school kids from cities, very disadvantaged communities, and they worked as scientists for the Nature Conservancy out in nature. It's called Leaders of Environmental Action or something, LEAF. And um, huge success rate. I mean, they, act, they, they weren't interns. They got paid money. They were given, um, so you have some from your school. So yeah, blessed. yeah, from the Environmental Charter School. So, you know, you take them on, um, so they, they really learn to do science. The success rate at which they convert to STEM science degrees is about 30 to 40 percent. The federal programs that try to encourage it never get above 10 percent. So uh, it's hands-on. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a truly, you know, amazing program. We t take them to colleges, get them all in. Well, I, that was my answer. We do the LEAF program. So I had, I had an answer when I had to answer this tough question. And that satisfied them. It's not huge numbers, but it's quality. It's real, real quality. Um, and it's kind of interesting that, that this young woman had this, she was, um, you know, the, the phrase, her job in the New York City was to Xerox things and bring coffee to the New York City board. She was an English major. And out of passion, she raised this money and created a program, and she became a director of the youth programs. It's, kind of, it's also kind of a cool story about one person. An English degree whose job was to you know, Xerox handouts and give coffee to the fancy, rich New York City people, and she launched this program. That was actually the beginning of conservation. Her thinking, and the thinking of, 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 of a lot of us in conservation was, we looked at the age distribution of the Nature Conservancy, um, and not good, not great. Um, we looked at the ethnic diversity of the Nature Conservancy, not great. Uh, and this would be true for any environmental group. So, you really care about conservation, you better do something about it and, and reach out to, to people where they are now. And that means you reach out to culturally diverse people who live in cities. Because if you don't have them, you're not going to have supporters in 50 years. That was one of the reasons that we, um, and, and so as I said, these all have really significant programs, really significant conservation programs in cities. Audubon has a big one. It's often tied to education, which is good. I'm going to go back. But then, you know, that's kind of a political reason and kind of a sort of a self-awareness reason. I should say one more thing about that story. We, um, we, we hired a social scientist to uh, track the success of the students through Facebook. And it's really good. You know, you do, when you do programs like this, you do impact analysis and you ask whether they're working and, and it worked. But then somebody had the bright idea, and I don't know whose idea it was. I can't even remember. That's asked the question, what's the impact of the students on the organization? So that means that we had social scientists come in and interview um, uh, staff who worked with them all over the country. Because they don't, if, 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 if you get a kid from LA or a kid from New York City, they don't necessarily work in New York City or LA. They can be sent to Alaska, Montana, anywhere to work out in the field. And it turned out the much biggest impact was on the organization. It was pretty, it was pretty dramatic. Uh, people would say, I never you know, thought of conservation this way. Changed, changed the thinking. OK, so we have about 100,000 generations as hunter-gatherers, at least. And at most, 1,000 generations kind of living in towns and stuff. That's probably, it, 
it, probably not even a thousand generations. The ratio is, you know, certainly more than a hundred to one. That means anybody who's an evolutionary biologist would tell you we're connected to nature in some way. I bet every one of you has been late at night walking on the street and felt the hair in the back of your neck, right? Prickly? That's you as prey. That's effectively you as prey. It's a biological response. So, I mean, we're really, really connected to nature. Even though we move into cities. That, you, you just don't lose that evolutionary history. And there's been a lot of books. You know, you've seen this, Last Child in the Woods, Biophilia. There's a whole series of books that say this in a different way. But it's all the same thing that uh, that experience, you know, do, th this feeling that our evolutionary history had us in nature, we move us into cities and something is lost. Something is lost. And until recently, uh, it's been stories. It hasn't been really good research. I'm going to tell you about a little bit of the research uh, that's got, getting much, much better. Skip over that. So one of their earliest ones, this was done in Germany. The students who live in country handle stress better than students from the city. And the stress, these are college students, so they can either live out in country towns or they live uh, in a city in Germany. And the stress, I think I have a cartoon that shows the stress. I like this. Yes. The stress was basically give people a timed math exam. There's nothing more stressful than a math exam. And then have somebody, they actually had this as an experimental treatment. Uh, this would not get by the human subjects board in the US. They actually had uh, a teacher screaming at them about the time limit and hurry up and do the exam. So they, it wasn't just the exam, they actually were being harassed. And then they looked at the performance on the exam, they took MRIs in the blood, they measured uh, cortical steroid stress chemicals, and the rural, uh, students in the, uh, handled the stress better by every measure they did. You know, at least it was an experiment, but you know, there's other variables, right? This, this made the front page of the New York Times. It was in a prestigious journal, The Nature. It got a lot of press, but uh, you know, the students that lived in, even though they tried to keep them the same, uh, they're not the same population. There are other differences besides country versus city. But it's the beginning. This is sort of the, the, so there's a lot of studies like that. And in fact, they're so believed, these studies are so believed, you can get, uh, look up forest health, Google forest health sometimes. It's actually thought of as a prescription in Japan. That, you, that if you go out in a forest, in nature, it's, it's, actually, it's medicine, forest medicine. They have institutes, and it's a, it's a treatment. It's used in the US now, with a pretty good successful rate for post-traumatic stress from our soldiers coming back. But it's actually still, the research is not that good. I mean, it's not, if you're a hardcore scientist or you teach science, it's not the perfect experiment. Because the, the populations are always, uh, it's not like you pick people at random and then you give them a treatment of nature, not nature. There's already differences in the population. Uh, I served on a committee of a PhD student, or I think did the first really good experiment, and we could critique that. But here's the hypothesis. Um, he actually grew up in LA. He's now a professor at University of Washington. Uh, he's a, he was a uh, script writer, and then went back to school as a script writer. And he loved nature, and he had kids, and so he, had, he asked this question, because it relaxed him, it made him feel good to take hikes. So we asked the question, does taking that walk in nature make you happier and smarter? And here's his experiment. He had a common pool. You know, you pay, the, here's maybe it's the weakness of it, it's pretty much college age kids. So you pay college students to be an experimental subject. You pay them money to be an experimental subject. But this is, there's no difference, the only difference is which treatment they're given. It's the same pool, right? And they take a 50 minute walk, on the dish in Stanford, he was at Stanford, that's the dish, 
If any of you been at Stanford, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a park, um, very, very paper, popular park close to Stanford. That's a Stanford campus. 50-minute walk there, or a 50-minute walk in Palo Alto. And Palo Alto is not urban blight. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it's a pleasant. And, and he, um, he, did two, he actually did MRIs, did brain scan, MRIs on him before and after. And he did all these cognitive and personality tests before and after. Perfect experimental design. Got the idea, right? Common pool of students, randomly signed one to walk up the dish, another one to walk down a Palo Alto Street, tests before and after, cognitive tests, mood tests, MRIs. Um, what do you find? Three or four papers that come out of this, and I will think I'll just summarize it. Um, I'm not going to talk about the data, but you know, there, you, you actually visually see different parts of the brain uh, flows to different parts of the brain depending on which treatment you got, and those brain parts are associated with uh, attributes of cognition or or mood. I summarize it here verbally. So, what does the nature walk do significantly? It reduces anxiety. It reduces rumination. So, rumination is a t is I learned this term from Greg's thesis. I thought it was good to ruminate, but it's not. Rumination is when you walk out of the house and you say, God, I, I forgot to say thank you to my partner, or have a good day, and I, God, I wish I should have done that, or I should have paid that bill and I didn't. It's just where you beat yourself up for your ruminating. It's like, God, I should have done that. It's not a really constructive feeling, that ruminating. So it decreased anxiety, decreased rumination, and decreased negativity. It increased your ability to do these math tests, memory tests, and positivity. And the brain stuff, there is a particular area of the brain that is associated with rumination, and then the MRIs showed that physiologically. Pretty interesting, right? I mean, he's now continuing this research. I mean, so there's all sorts of questions that brings up. How long does it last for? How long does it wear off? Could you get it for 15 minutes? Is it, um, it's not the exercise, because you exercise it both, yeah? Well, that's actually the same scale. I mean, I mean it's, it's the same thing, right? It's, it's the inverse. So they're less negative and they're more positive. So, right. I mean, so they're less negative, right? And more positive, yeah. Right. Um, you know, so you could, they, they at least they were both doing exercise. You know, in his thesis defense, people criticized him and said, well, maybe they're doing more exercise going up a hill than a flat road. I don't think that was it. My actually criticism was, I think, this is, I think this is true. This is a real result. I think a lot of people do find this. My challenge to him, and I think it's an interesting challenge, was that we all find ways to uh, de-stress. It could be cooking, right? It could be painting. Who knows? It could be shopping. Jerry likes to shop. So, um, uh, but, but, so there might be a substitute. You know, the question is, is there a substitute for nature? That's a harder question. But this, you know, these results came out about three years ago. He's now, he did a postdoc, and now he's a professor. He's continuing it. It's an exploding field. I think in five years, we will have a lot of answers about this. My intuition, because I've read all the lousy research, it's lousy, but the results always come out the same way and are pretty strong. They're not just little. That is that, um, in, in fact, we can think of nature um, as somehow therapeutic for our cognition, our ability to focus, our mood. But it need not be the nature that a conservation biologist would define. Probably don't care whether it's native or non-native. Probably don't care how biodiversity it is, but. <laughs> Isn't this sort of a, that was scientific way back when in cities like in New, uh, New York, Long Beach, and others, having parks and very park, a lot of land within the urban city that they re recognized maybe, that, uh, maybe they didn't do it because of the science, but they had the same sort of intuitive feeling that this is a good thing for, if we're going to have big cities, <laughs> we're going to have a lot of parks. 
I mean, if you think about that, 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 you know, what you said is true. If you sat there and characterized what cities you thought were the most beautiful cities in the world, they'd often have parks. Uh, and that's certainly true. And there was, a, you know, um, there was a sense of aesthetics. But it wasn't couched this way. No, of course not. Right. And, uh, and there wasn't any science behind it. No, of course not. <laughs> but, but I think there, you know, I, th I think you would have, I mean, people do connect in some way. That's why I say I think there is something people, to it. Just like we like to live near the ocean, we like to live near right. Rick or rivers. Or, yeah, rivers. Right. So if I just want to just compare it to you know, country walker before the country walker, or did you used to care for the city walker? No, it's 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 the change in them. So he's actually I, I it's it's a it's a thing that's called before after control impact to get jargon. So it's the it's the change. What so, to the, um, uh, the the they actually didn't have a they had a little bit of a change because of exercise, but the change was much bigger. And that's, that's why you want to do it, with before and after. This is taken very seriously. The other, I have some friends who are architects. Any architects here? Um, uh, we had Jack Ma on our board at the Nature Conservancy. He's a real believer in this. There's architecture firms that hire a cognitive psychologists to think about this. So here's what Jack Ma did. This is Jack Ma's, uh, this is Alibaba's new building, China. I think it's at 30,000, I forget how many, maybe it's more than that, employees. This is Alibaba's new building. So here's, here's how Jack Ma implements this for his business. Um, in the elevators, it, there's signs that describe walks you take for different length meetings. So you don't have a meeting in your office, you take a walk. If it's a 15-minute meeting, you take a 15-minute walk. If it's a 30-minute meeting, you take a 30-minute walk. You know how in, in all of our institutional buildings, they put, your, there's a, like a bathroom on every floor? Jack Ma has outhouses, only they're not like that. <laughs> but you actually have to get out to go to the bathroom. And they're beautiful facilities. So yeah, actually, now when I interact with my staff and faculty at UW, I, I never sit in the office with them. I take them for a walk around campus. I mean, not UW, UCLA. But he act, I mean, there are a number of firms, Google's doing this, the new Amazon building is thinking of doing this. In other words, building in this notion that getting out and somehow uh, it increases your creativity and it's, it's ended up in, in um, it's being taken very seriously. Take it, take it very, very seriously. Um, so what are the more obvious reasons? So the one reason that when we think about uh, making cities more livable for nature and ecological reasons is this notion that we are a species that, uh, that evolved you know, in nature. Some connection to nature must have some therapeutic benefit. Maybe there are substitutes for it. Maybe there are technical substitutes. That might be true, but there's something there. I th you know, uh, another reason we think about nature, and I uh, this is especially true in LA, you know, the Million Trees program, is heat waves. So there was a 2003 heat wave in Europe. It was 15 degrees Fahrenheit higher than usual, and it lasted several days. Uh, and in Paris, it was deadly. 400 extra deaths. Uh, people were basically, a lot of the buildings were stone buildings. Normally, a stone building will keep you cool. But if the heat persists for five days, the heat wave persists for five days, instead of keeping you cool, it becomes a stone oven, which is what happened. Uh, and there's all sorts of articles that showed the neighborhoods were neighborhoods with fewer trees. So that's, this, is a, this is a Paris um, figure for 400. They actually have good data for all of France. And a really good predictor was the trees in the neighborhood. A very, very good predictor about the impact was the trees. So it's not hard to imagine that trees, um, you know, they shade, they, they're cooling, they they're, they're like a um, humidifier. They, when they transpire, that also cools, the evaporation cools. And so we have city, you know, trees for the heat island ef effect is a, a pretty reasonable thing to do for your sustainable city. 
especially reasonable in LA. Yeah, there is. So there is, there, there, there is data that sort of the, the total heat balance for a city. And I'll refer to a study about that. But it, uh, and it, it becomes really significant. I, I'm not sure if I have it. Um, this has got a little bit of it. I think I might have a figure that, that speaks to that a little bit. So urban trees, cooler cities. This is the normal model. <coughs> you know, so if you have these trees, it's cooler, and there's de decrease deaths from heat. And when you do the analyses, in general, that's pretty true. In general, that's pretty true. Uh, the problem is uh, it's not an automatic. Because the heat budget is not just driven by trees. See if I got it. And, if, and in fact, um, it depends on how much the trees transpire. Uh, it depends on. On, it, it turns out, I didn't put a graph in here. I thought I had a graph to answer your question, but I don't. Um, a lot of what goes on in the city is convection, is wind. So it's not shade, it's wind that carries the, the, the um, heat away. And depending on the climate you're in and the type of buildings, uh, trees can either be a benefit or do you no good or actually harm. And they can harm because they interfere with the wind. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you naturally have, just like they use wind breaks on the prairies for, to stop erosion, if you naturally have wind-driven convective cooling, so if wind is what's carrying your, the heat out of your city, and you put trees, they're not going to do you any good. And, uh, it, and whether the wind will drive your, the heat out of your city depends on the climate and depends on the building. There's a, there was a very famous paper, you, you may have heard this on NPR or something like this, this is maybe like <coughs> 10 years ago. The question was, could cities affect their weather? And there was a famous paper done, you know, you know how on the, on the, it always seems like it rains on the weekends? So this paper was, was looking at, at emissions, uh, it was the East Coast cities that the study was done on. You accumulate the pollution, you accumulate so much that then you get the, the rain on a Saturday and Sunday but then you don't have the traffic for a while, then it clears up on Monday. And there was a statistical study of that for a number of East Coast cities. So <laughs> as a combination of the emissions, the, the cities do actually influence the local weather. Really interesting paper. So the, the, the lesson for the trees thing is, uh, and it's why you know, we have a group of students and tree people here in LA is doing it now. Um, trees are a good thing, but you can't count on it but you can collect the data. It's really easy to go out in the city and get kids and students to just collect the data. You can go out and see whether they benefit you or not. It's not a hard thing to do to get temperature measurements, right? And do it in a systematic and scientific way. I actually think it's a great, uh, there's been a little bit of overselling of trees. And, in, and instead of overselling trees, we should say trees could be a wonderful opportunity for our city. Let's engage all our city schools in collecting data to find out where to put them and what type of tree. It's so easy to answer with the simplest type of data, no fancy instrumentation. Really, really cool project. So we, we actually have some students doing that with tree people, but not a big enough scale. You ought to really mobilize kids to do it. Another, pro, another reason people uh, plant trees, so there's no question on average, I know, this is me just pulling it out of my head from reading the literature. But probably about 80% of the time, trees do do a really good job of cooling you. It's just that you don't want to invest in the 20% of the time when they don't, right? But, it's a, but there's all the, you know, so New York City had a million tree planting program. LA had a million tree planting program. You know, both of them. And when they talk about them, they often talk about it. The heat island, that's OK. They also talk about them for carbon. Not OK. They don't make much of a dent in carbon. And because the scale at which you'd have to plant trees to have any significant impact on 
carbon is just more than the scale that any of these cities are, ma are, are managing. And in many cases, they use a ton of water. They use a ton of water. Here's the trees in LA um, and where they come from uh, uh, and their water use. So this is the daily water loss. And there's all, you know, you look at the street trees, they vary by two orders of magnitude in the water demands of those trees. And when you have the LA tree planting program, the neighborhood, I mean, it's the neighborhood that has to water the trees. Or either a nonprofit group or the people living there have to water the trees. So, uh, and, and, and this is true for a lot of the tree planting programs around the country, is they haven't asked the question, what trees should we plant? Again, it's an easy question to answer. It's a very easy, you don't need, mod, you know, it's a very easy question to answer. You figure out, you know, the trees that have the lowest water demand, and you plant them. And, and if you're looking at cooling, you look at their canopy, you know, and then you take some measurements. So I guess my message here with trees and cities, yes, good. Good thing for a lot of reasons, not for carbon, but for cooling, for aesthetics, for a lot of reasons. But don't, you be scientific about it, collect some data, don't just automatically do it. The Million Trees program has not gone too well for LA. It hasn't gone very, very well. Because uh, there hasn't been uh, a real effort to like, say what type of trees, and because of the water demands and the maintenance. Got a little bit better in New York City because the city paid for invested more money in it. Well, so that's an interesting question. There weren't trees here, except along the river. There weren't trees in LA. Along the river, there were, there's a riparian zone. So there were trees along the river, but there weren't trees here. Yeah, but I mean, in the, in, the, in, the, in the flat down here, there really, there isn't much trees here. So you, you, that is a big debate, is, is you know, you, you raised the question of what's here. Maybe you take what's not, in Europe, they don't have that sentiment. They ask the question of what are the trees that are going to do the best job. Easiest maintenance, lowest cost at least for the city to maintain, give the greatest cooling effect. That's a different question. It's, and than asking, you know, what was here before. So you could, that's a sort of a decision to make. I don't know, I mean, I'm not. Presumably, yeah. But you could even get lower water, uh, um, you know, what, what are some of the, these are Australian trees, not native, and they have the, uh, the lowest water usage. So you, you know, you could go that way. Yeah, you. Right. I'm just saying it's it's not an easy choice. Another big thing that you do in sustainable cities is um, stormwater retention. So by the same, you know, you, why do you want to retain stormwater when you have the rain? Um, if your sewage system is connected, you want to retain the water. But even if your sewage system is not connected. Uh, when the rain runs out of the, it picks up a lot of uh, pollutants and goes into the ocean. So the ideal thing to happen with rain is not to have it run off, it's to have it sink in. That only happens with, gra you know, with vegetation. That only happens with vegetation. You know, LA area actually has, ground has, actually has planned areas for groundwater retention. So you can recharge groundwater in certain regions if you know what's under it. But even small scale, um, uh, retention does you some good in dropping runoff. The city that's most advanced on this is Philadelphia. Philadelphia has an aging infrastructure. They suffered a lot of floods. One of th in, in one year, one out of three businesses had flood damage in Philadelphia. One out of three. 
And they did this sort of the, the calculations. If you, it's a fascinating thing. If you look up green infrastructure in Philadelphia, they're doing really, really creative things with promote, having market incentives. This is sort of their, their sort of artist rendition of what they want. Rooftops, as much green built throughout the cities uh, as possible. But um, that can replace a lot of gray infrastructure in terms of stormwater retention. And there's more and more. Washington, D.C. is probably the second most advanced city. Mm -hmm. There's an example of that. I'm a high school botanist. Mm -hmm. And this year, the land event that I remember from COVID, about 165,000 acres of property. Half is gray. Nothing growing there at all. And when we got rain, it all sheeted off. Yeah, this is what I mean. Right, the vegetation and and sort of stormwater retention is incredibly effective, and it worked at. And uh, whereas I was sort of disrespecting trees for carbon because it doesn't really make much of a contribution, it's 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 a lot easier for these contributions to add up. Yeah, it's a lot it's a lot easier for these contributions to be to be noticeable. And to, to be significant and noticeable. And I think you'll see a lot of cities going to this more and more. The trade off, the, you know, out here in, our, in an arid environment, the, the issue is always water usage, though. Back east, that's not an issue. So the cities that are doing the most of this, you know, are, are in the east. You don't have to worry about water use. So. In the east? Well, again, I don't think back east it would. Yeah, I mean, I, I've never seen that actually even brought up in the east. No, I mean, I've, all, I've, I've never seen it even mentioned in any of these eastern cities. But I can imagine it would be in, in, in an arid situation. River, uh, the other thing going on big with cities, this is downtown Seoul, six lane freeway through the center of it. Ripped up, who would have thought it? Ripped up. This is the river now. 12 species of uh, fish in it, and a fish. Birds, you know, insect biodiversity. The people love it. Cost a ton of money, but the city loves it. They're all out there. Seoul. In Korea, Seoul in Korea. But who would have, I mean, look at that. That's more dramatic than um, the LA River. Yeah, yeah, I, because I lived in Providence. <laughs> yes, yes. And Buddy Siazzi was an interesting mayor. Right. <laughs> Uh, you know, the cities, this is actually one of the most exciting stories of restor the, restoring urban rivers works. It's always expensive. I've never seen a story of it being regretted. Uh, I have a friend, that woman who I told you started the TNC program for children, I mean for kids, LEAF. She wanted to have her own organization. She moved to Yonkers um, for an organization called, I'm going to forget it, she's going to kill me. Oh well, I shall have to kill me. But um, it does in Yonkers in the community. It uses the kids to do restoration, and in there it was—I forget the name of the river. There was a river that was totally under concrete in Yonkers, which is a very poor town. Yonkers is right next to the Bronx. It chose not to incorporate. Really poor, blighted town. The kids uncovered the part of the river. They're still going more on it, and you go there now. It's beautiful. I mean you. There's story after story, Pittsburgh, et cetera. Um, uncovering rivers works. They've done it in Seattle. Salmon come back. You, you, it works. 
I literally have I've never heard any regret about a, about a restored river through a city in any sense. So you have the LA River. I have no idea what they do with the highway. They said the first. <laughs> <laughs> they still had to move their people. They, they, they still did, yeah. That's a good question. I should look that up. Because I've only read about the effects on the river. And I, that's a good question. I mean, what they do with the, with the transportation. And of course, everybody knows the LA River story, which is ongoing. But it is an artist's rendition of, you know, this is one artist's rendition of what the LA River might look like. But again, you know, it's, it's good. It's, um, the LA River will be a success. There's no question about that. There will be huge public debates about how to do it, what's allowed, how much concrete, how much nature. Um, you know, it'll be it'll be a vibrant community discussion. I'm confident that once it's done, almost no matter how it's done, people will think it's pretty cool. But there will be a lot of debates about it because there's so many. It, you know, there's so many decisions to be made. Who's it for? You know, what about environmental justice? Does it gentrify the neighborhood, drive people out? So it's, those are questions that happen when you do the greening of a city. Um, so on climate change in cities, sea level rise, heat, and extreme weather, Another thing to recognize about climate change is cities are complicated uh, creatures in a way that uh, they're not self-contained. They draw resources and, and, and they're connected in the electricity grid. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're connected. And so vulner there are vulnerabilities that arise because of the demands of a city and climate change. One of the biggest ones, one of the best examples, um, was the New Delhi blackout. So New Delhi Black Eye, there were 700 million people without power. It wasn't just in New Delhi, it was that whole region of, of India. New Delhi, I mean, the hospitals, it was gruesome. The hospitals were shut down, everything. The, the train stopped running, uh, it just froze. Imagine a city like New Delhi just freezing for several days. Yep. And, wh and why did it happen? That not, that's not just New Delhi. That's the overall blackout in that region of India. 700 million without power. Yeah. yeah. 700 million without power. Um, but it was an interesting combination. What happened, it was a heat wave. Everybody turned on their air conditioners. It overtaxed the grid. Also in the heat wave, there's agricultural fields there. They pumped more. They had to pump to irrigate more. So. The electric irrigation pumps and the air conditioners shut down the grid in a heat wave. So that's a type of thinking. That, that, that is, we're going to see more of that. I mean, these extreme events in climate tax our engineered and our infrastructure in ways that are going to surprise us with these type of consequences. So it's not just the direct effects of you know, sea level rise, heat directly. Um, and rain, it's these interactions with our infrastructure, which is vulnerable. We th you don't think of connecting your infrastructure to the climate. You, you might think of connecting your body, you know, you know, how uncomfortable and your health to the climate, but you don't think of, of connecting the electric grid to the climate, but the electric grid is impacted by the climate. Yeah, I don't know that one, but, but air, air conditioning is often associated with overtaxing things. <coughs> On the other hand, uh, this, is the, the rec, this is what air conditioning, this is the growth of air conditioning in the US. Um, share of households with air conditioning, it's almost, a, it's almost up to 100%. Starting off you know, very, very li little, bit 1958, and then climbing really rapidly. You could, it's, very, it's, it's a sort of standard economic technique to look at the extra deaths that occur because of hot days. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty routine economic analysis. 
So you're not counting deaths, you're counting extra deaths because of hot days. And we have good weather data for these hot days. Hot days, it turns out it's over 80 degrees, typically, on average. So that's, that's what it, it turns out for human health impacts. Um, and now it's estimated that air conditioning in the US saves 20,000 lives a year. And that number is going to go up as, the, as global warming. But you do notice sort of the irony of that? Right? There's, there's, a, there's a sort of irony in this. So air conditioning is energy uses, dumps emissions out. The, the emissions raise the temperature, give you a greater need for air conditioning. It's sort of an interesting thing to think about. But there's no question it saves lives. In India, which doesn't have as much air, I mean, even though that shut it down, uh, 100,000 people could die in India because of the heat weather. weather. And the question is, you know, um, a, a debate going on in India is if they burn coal, they can get electricity and air conditioning to all their population pretty quickly and save lives. Or they can wait for a distributed grid of solar power and you know, lose maybe 50,000 each year. Not an easy, th these environmental questions are not that easy, phrase that way. So I think I want to, um, until we leave some time for questions, I've gone on way too long. I, I sort of want to end on, on this, n this notion of, first of, of what kind of city do we want? Uh, it really is a choice. And I've, I've, uh, these are pictures. We, we did a research project with some students going around and asking LA residents, of showing them pictures of what type of urban parks they want. As you know, LA is investing in urban parks right now. Big public bond, they're investing in urban parks. Who gets to decide what type of park? We showed them pictures of this versus this. We had two other pictures. What do they want? Depends on your ethnicity. Total. Really clear cut predictions depending on your ethnicity. I'll give you the most stereotyped one where it's out. It's been showed up in lots of studies. Uh, Latinos who vote uh, more environmentally than any other group in California consistently. Latinos are the strongest environmental supporters in California by far. It's not even close. By far. They want parks that provide social. They want parks, but they want social activity. Affluent whites want that. Want to go hike by themselves. <laughs> so, uh, but there's other choices. Uh, you know, the red crowned parrot. So, you know, parrot, there's parrots are thriving in, in LA. Red crowned parrot is one of the parrots that's thriving in LA. Non native species, do we get rid of it? People enjoy it? On top of that, in its native range in Mexico, it's endangered. And there's more parrots living in Southern California than there are in its native range. <laughs> so if you cared about global biodiversity and want to save species, maybe you should encourage. There could be more of these questions. It's carp in the LA River. It's one of the most abundant non-native. When we restore the LA River, do we try to get rid of the non-natives? Ospreys, a lot, of, a lot of our native birds that we love, eat these carp. So do we get rid of them or not? Those are the things that you, decisions that, to be made with um, our cities. The, again, again this, cities is our natural habitat right now. But there is no right nature for cities, really. There is no right nature for them. It's our, we, we make the future of cities. We make that habitat. Couple more slides to provoke. If you read the literature and they talk about resilience, if you go into the technical literature, they always show this picture. You want cities where the marble stays in the ball, in the bowl. This is the marble, it's an unstable environment, it rocks. You, uh, you, you want this situation because the marble, it's harder to knock the marble out of the bowl, right? This picture shows in different forms. In so many papers, it's been around for 30 years. It's, the mo it's actually in some urban plan. Some city plans actually show this picture conceptually for urban resilience. 
They call this resilience. So um, I think that's a terrible model. Anybody have any idea why I think it's a terrible model? I'm just curious if you can anticipate what I'm saying. Uh, well, I like simple. I like Jerry. <laughs> no, no it's, it's a, I mean, the world's always changing. We do want to have some control over the, I mean, we, there are, there are, I mean, we don't want, you know, a degraded environment. We don't, there's things we don't want. There's no question that we want to, you know, channel things. But it's more of the issue of, it's always changing. All the more so because of the climate. And what we're doing is directing which valley the marble goes down. It's a very different way of thinking about the world. If you thought about the marble in the bowl, you would say, probably for certain, you didn't want those parrots or carp. Because that's not what it used to be. It, your, your marble's gotten out of the bowl. It's a different ecosystem. If you had this view, you might say, well, we could tolerate them as long as they provide food for this, you know, for, for some birds we care about, and, and you know, they're, for some other reasons, we, we could tolerate them. It's a, because this is about the world's always changing. Sometimes when I hear people talk about cities and, and nature, they're too much about the marble in the bowl and they're not enough about this. By the way, this model came from a very famous developmental biologist. And it's, it was a model, when we develop as humans, when, when, when we're a developing embryo and you're, you, you, you experience all sorts of environmental shocks, like you're thrown out in a coal, you know, when you're, when you're developing, even when you're in the womb and you're developing, there's shocks to your environment. And we have, you know, well-evolved genetic systems that canalize development. That's what it's called. It's canalized development. So you're changing. You're growing into, a, into you know, an adult in that direction, but you have systems in place so you stay within a, uh, um, a certain development they'll bound. The very sort of deep but influential theory of human development, but it actually, I think, applies to nature and how we think about the modern world. The, um, the meme, the narrative that's out there so often is that the planet is fragile. If you go to, uh, go, just Google fragile anything. Fragile river, fragile desert, fragile tropics, fragile coral reefs, just pick it. And you'll find, you'll find every conservation organization uses that. Ask yourself if you really think that's true. What's the data? For sure we could degrade things. But you look at the river restoration stuff. These rivers have been hammered. The Guada, what's, what's the river in San Jose that I've been running alongside for 20 years? It was so bad it had no steelhead. It had uh, you know, syringes. They, they cleaned it up and now you see steelhead in there. There are, for certain, there are things you can do from which ecosystems have a hard time recovering and may not recover. Yes, that is true. But, you, but by the same token, you can also perturb things a lot, and do a lot to them, and they can recover. It's a scientific question. What's going to happen? What's going to happen with the LA River? It's a scientific question. What's going to happen with the um, Santa Monica Mountains after disturbance? It's a scientific question. It's not assuming that they're fragile. That is not an assumption you should make. Do I have any more? I think I want to end there. Jerry wanted me to tell one story, so I have to tell one story. It kind of relates to this. When I was a, uh, a 60s activist, radical, you know, one of those guys, um, <laughs> my hero was Edward Abbey, and I read his book. And I probably read it many times. And I've gotten in trouble for telling this story, but I, be, I became friends with a... Um, uh, historian who had gone and gotten his personal journals. And so I got a copy of his personal journals that were written at the same time as he wrote the book. And I'm not going to remember the quotes as well as, as Jerry might remember them, but, but um, there are a couple of classic quotes. Um, and, and one of them is, um, you know, oh, I, I, you know, behold the loneliness I love the wilderness with nothing in it. 
It is so pristine and wonderful. In a journal, at the, That's right, that's right. You're, see, I knew you. I don't experience loneliness, I experience loveliness. In his personal journal, he said, oh my God, I'm so lonely, Rita, Rita, his wife. <laughs> the other thing is he made it sound pristine. He could see the nuclear bombs being tested in Nevada. He could see it. Why do I tell that story? It's related to this. We have narratives. We build environmental narratives. And that's OK, they're cultural. That's OK. And they, those environmental narratives may decide the choices you make about the LA River. And we have those. But we have narratives. But there's also science. Don't confuse the narratives with the science. Fragile Earth is a narrative. Ask yourself what the science is about recovery of systems. The science is sometimes fragile, sometimes incredibly resilient, not necessarily fragile. And it's for that reason, actually, the Institute, we founded a thing called Laboratory for Environmental Narratives, where a science department, we merged with the humanities to ask this question. How do our narratives constrain the way we think about things? And, and it's especially important in cities. My fear is that when we say nature in cities, our narrative is, oh, it's got to be like that nature out there in Yosemite. And instead, it should be a very special nature for cities. We need a new narrative for nature in cities. Thanks. That's it. The, you know, like, uh, can you imagine an LA without the automobile? You, you know, there's uh, automobiles will never disappear, just like horses never disappeared. You know, uh, as a as a form of transport. So what I, I imagine probably what will happen is uh, some people will maintain automobiles because they like them, but they'll, you know, imagine 100 years from now, much much less so. Right, so, you, you, so yeah, robot cars, whatever, self-driving cars. Yeah. So, you know, it's not clear. It's not clear what that's going to do to emissions. It's not clear. What they, what, the big impact that self-driving cars, this is a complicated, let's see if I can make this clear. So we have technology to, we have technology to produce cars now. Uh, you know, that are electrical cars, maybe they're hydrogen cars. We have technology to, to produce green cars. They're very expensive. So normal people can't afford them. But what's the problem with cars? They sit in your, they, they sit in your, they're unused most of the time. So you don't actually save any money by doing it. What automatic, what the, what the self-driving cars will do when, when Uber goes self-driving, Uber will go self-driving, Uber will get all um, no emission cars because it will pay off for them because the car is always in use. So I think, I, I think the, the, inner, the, the mix of, of self-driving means a car could be always in use because the car is always in use. The savings you get on, uh, and will be sufficient that it will make it affordable. That's my prediction. I have no idea if it's true. Give me a microphone. We want to... I have a uh, two-part question. One. What part has wars over the world have played into climate change? And also, too, with sea level rise, the climate's changing, and as land becomes more scarce and more valuable, and we don't address these problems, the chances of us having more wars now over land in, uh, in the world. So resource wars is what you're basically talking about. Yes. I mean, there is a history of resource wars, for sure. You know, countries go to war for resources. But and don't you think that the next one will be over water? I mean, that's, although if you go to the Middle East, you know, you see them actually getting along over water, strangely enough. But if you look at uh, all of the Tibetan plateau and the number China. of dams that, that uh, China is building on the Mekong River, that they'll be able to take every drop of water out of that river if they choose to. Right. 
So, so, so re there's another really interesting book that just came out that takes, says, take a different take on it. It basically says that it's inevitable for inequity to increase in human populations. Everybody talks about how we, just a few people have all the money in the world. And that always happens. And then at some point, there's a disaster, and it redistributes it. One of the disasters is wars. So instead of it, that might be a view of resource wars, but this, uh, it, you know, it's, it's the assumption that wars, famine, disease, equalize, and you go, and equalize. But there's always been resource wars. Other questions? Peter, I want to come back to one of the things you said. That the, our cities in the future will be what we want them to be. We will determine that. There's that the wonderful, there's a little book by Will and Ariel Durant, the historians, right. and they have that line in there, the future never just happened. We it make always it. was created. Right. And yeah. we will create what our cities are. We'll stumble along. Sustainability is not one, a linear path. We'll make a lot of mistakes. And we'll all define it a little differently. Too. And we'll probably define it differently. A little bit differently. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that, that, that's an ama that is a really, the, I, I love that quote. I mean, it's, the future doesn't happen. It doesn't just happen. We, uh, we, we, we do create it by our decisions. One of the early slides with Mesopotamia and 8,000 years ago in civilizations uh, like Egypt and other, are there infrastructure lessons we need to learn from what they did? I, that's a, the, that artist rendition was a huge city. How did? Well, you know, they, they did have irrigation. Um, they had irrigation systems. They had roads and stuff like that. I mean, the, most people studied. Yeah, I, do, I don't really know enough about the archaeology. I do know that the major, one of the major ways they study those cities is to ask why they failed. They do ask that question, why they failed. And they often fail uh, because they, they fail. In their, they basically, they, as I said, they all started in calorie-rich regions. They don't have that those calories to get from the surrounding landscape because of mismanagement, drought or something, they collapse. And it was interesting when you said that, uh, that we, they tore the walls down and uh, began to globalization and trade. Are, are we uh, making a mistake build a, <laughs> building a wall? <laughs> I certainly think so. <laughs> So uh, to that note, one of my favorite statistics is, you know, the U.S., um, uh, we, we've won more than half the Nobel Prizes in science, the U.S. has. The last round that the, that the uh, Nobel Prize was given, there were six Americans that won Nobel Prize uh, last, last round in science. Six science winners in Nobel Prize, all U.S. citizens, not one of them was born in this country. Not one of them was born in this country. So, yes, we're making a mistake. <laughs> Peter, I, thank you for a wonderful lecture. Next week will be our last session in this course, and we're going to talk about uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach and, and uh, whether they're on the path to sustainability. And we'll have Jonathan Parfrey from Climate Resolve who will describe Los Angeles, and we will have John Chrysler from Long Beach and so I hope you will all come to that. Peter, thank you for a great talk. <laughs>